So, and I said, I really like uh, encounter and development and the preface of uh, Escobar's book all, are always great. Please always read it. The preface of encountering and development is great. And here when, when he explains why design for the pluriverse, he describes our times of change because we are in a living such a huge, enormous crisis of climate, food, energy, poverty, meaning, and now pandemics. So we have, we have so many crises that it asks us to change a lot. It asks us to change our civilizational model. And uh, what he says that the book is about the potential of design to contribute to the profound cultural and ecological transition seen as needed. And he really believes in, the, in this potential of design to contribute to the transformations. And when, it's, when, when we talk about trans, uh, transformations and transitions, uh, it's about everything has to change. It's, it's not only about changing capitalism, the economic model, or changing some cultural traits as individualism or consumerism. We're talking about changing an entire way of life and a whole style of world making. And Escobar say that some designers claim that the crisis demands nothing less than the reinvention of the human. What means to be human? To sh how do we shape our presence on planet Earth? So this book has two main sources of inspiration. The most important is the political struggles of indigenous, Afro-descendant, peasant, and marginalized groups in Latin America. They are defending not only their resources and territories, but their entire, entire ways of being in the world. This is a, because, especially because I'm, I'm, I'm Brazilian, I'm South American, uh, 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 this is a thing that is very dear, very dear to my, to my heart. And then the second source of inspiration are discourses and practice of visionaries and activists all over the world from different spheres who are engaged in bringing about the transitions. And he asks, can design actually contribute to enabling the communal forms of autonomy that underline these transition visions and collective projects? Can design actually contribute to, 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 to changing the world? There are so many claims that the, the design is going to change everything, but can it actually uh, contribute? For him, it uh, this uh, asks for a real orientation of design from the functionalist, rationalistic, and industrial traditions that design is founded on that uh, traditions toward a type of rash rationality instead of practice attuned to the, to the relational dimension of life. It's a big, it's a big re reorientation. So the first part of the book the name is design for the real world, but which world, what design, what real? So he does an overview of design literature and outline for a cultural studies approach to design. It's basically a literature review. And for him, any serious inquiry into contemporary design must be a journey into the trials and tribulations of capitalism and modernity since design has been a central political technology of modernity. The second part of the book is about the ontological reorientation of design. Reorientation that we are not focused on the creation of objects, services, and buildings. It's to the creation of form of, forms of life, forms of being. Design has an, uh, an ontological dimension because when we are designing tools, and tools can be objects, structures, policies, expert systems, discourse, and narrative, and then you can think about uh, symbols, signs. We are creating ways of being. We are creating rituals. We are creating uh, behaviors. So we design our world and our world design us back. So this is the ontological dimension of design. And today, 
like modern design uh, practice and theory has an ontological background. Uh, four beliefs are central to this, this default setting. First, the belief in the individual. And he sees it as a Trojan uh, horse, because when we started to talk about the individual, uh, we are uh, helping to destroy communal place-based forms of life. So uh, a big part of modern culture is based on this belief. Then there is the belief in the real, the, the belief that there is a, a reality out there. We are separate from the reality. And this belief is the basis of uh, the, ma uh, is, uh, the mastery over nature, so exploitation of nature. Uh, this is the basis of uh, capitalism. Then there is the belief in science, because this belief, nothing wrong in believing in science, but this belief in Western science um, do not allow people to, to listen to other ways of knowing, to other forms of knowledge. And then the belief in the economy. So all, everything that's about the future belongs to the, this field of economy. So we, we don't think about the, the future as something that is created in, the, in other forms of relationship. For him, we should go beyond this divide uh, be, be, between nature and culture, this dualism, to, a, uh, to ration, relationality. Relationality, we can talk about it in, in terms that nothing pre-exists the relations that constitute it. Life is interrelation. Life is interdependence. But to talk about rela relationality, we have to, to get out of the theoretical space into some domain of experience. You don't know intellectually relation, uh, relationality. You have to experience. So, he says that theorists cannot maintain both uh, feet in, the acad in acad ac academy and purport that they, we, are bringing about a different world. We need to put one foot in, the, in a relational world or worlds to practice what we preach. So it's something that you, we cannot stay in our ivory tower, read about relational worlds, read, read about other epistemologies, and think that we are changing. We have to really go, go out there and, and experience. It's about experience other worlds. Now, just lastly, the third part is the pro proper design for the, the pluriverse. <laughs> All right, so um, so I'm just going to introduce you to uh, some of the ideas of the, th the third section of the book. Um, Renata, you're still sharing, so then you can advance for me. Um, so in the third section, uh, Escobar talks about a lot of the discourses of transition, because you know, as Renata said at the start, we're talking about this major transition that we're going to um, going through in the world. And he talks about different types of transition discourses, such as post-development, degrowth, buen vivir, and post-extractionism. And then he also says that transitions are not emergent. Um, they are emergent, they're not designed. So we could think that we are going to design a transition, but actually the transition is happening. You know, it's emerging out of the, um, the context. Uh, and um, so transition discourses from both the global north and the global south. He has um, identified different trends in the transition discourses, but both of these discourses are um, advocating for profound and cultural, economic, and political transformation of dominant institutions and practices. Uh, next slide. He then presents for us like two case studies, one on transition design by um, Carnegie Mellon University. And you know, I have to start off saying that I have always resisted the word transition in transition design because actually in a lot of cultures, transition has to deal with death. 
And so, you know, whenever I heard transition design, I thought about that. And when I saw transition design at, at Carnegie Mellon, I was like, why are they naming their course this? But, you know, um, Escobar makes it make sense to me now, right? Um, and but, it, but, yeah. I, but I, re I really feel that transition design is about death. It's about the death of a, 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 a way of... Uh, of an of epistemology. Life. And, yes, yes. Yes. And it makes sense, you know. <laughs> and, but I, before that was what I was always resisting, you know, this idea of... It's almost like design around death. And it, yeah, you're right, Renat. It's like death of this uh, worldview and epistemology. So he pre presents um, the CMU uh, PhD program as a type of case study, as design around a different kind of outcome, and then presents these 10 um, principles of transition design at CMU that it uses living systems theory, um, solutions that protect and restore social and natural ecosystems, sees everyday lifestyles as the most fundamental context for design, advocates place-based globally networked solutions, design solutions for varying horizons of time, um, links existing solutions, uh, amplifies emergent grassroots solutions, basis solutions on maximizing satisfiers for the widest range of needs, sees the designer's mindset as an essential component of the design process and calls for the reintegration and recontextualization of diverse transdisciplinary knowledge. Um, Escobar talks a lot about the link with nature and um, also non-human, um, what to say, ecosystems um, or non-human life, you know, so it's not just about us. Uh, next slide, Renata. And then the second case study he describes is about uh, Mancini's text, uh, Design When Everyone Designs. And so there are four main principles in, that he describes in this, this section where we live in a world where everyone has to design and redesign their existence. The global project of design is the support of individual and collective life projects. So, um, you know, we're not just focusing on products and outcomes, we're, we're focusing on life by ourselves and with other people. Um, the world is undergoing a great transition. Design may foster a culture of cosmopolitan localism. People's actions to change their everyday life conditions increasingly take place through collaborative organization. Um, and all of the above takes place within an international conversation on design intended to transform the cultural background for both expert and non-expert design work. And um, in this area, uh, I think Escobar was actually citing Mancini where he was talking about discussing social innovation practice from a design perspective um, enriches the social science understanding of how change happens and it radicalizes design practice. So both fields are benefit, benefiting from this kind of work. Next slide. Uh, then uh, also in this section, um, Escobar writes a lot about autonomous design where the community practices design of itself. And again, um, presents some principles, um, Every design activity must start with a strong presupposition that people are practitioners of their own knowledge. What, community what the community designs is an acquiring or learning system about itself. Every design process involves a statement of problems. And, oh, and then this exercise may take the form of building a model of the system that generates the problem of communal concern. And I put the, the pages so that you could see some, you, you can refer back to them. All right, next slide. There is something that I did, yes. he also talks about uh, autonomous design that is, is ch uh, change transformation based on ancestrality. So he, he talks about ancestrality, the ancestral, not as an attachment to the past, but it's, um, it's uh, something that allows communities to, 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 to create a new future, new forms of life. So this, I think that is another aspect of autonomous design that uh, I, I think is very interesting. Because especially because uh, modernity is all about the new, the new, the new. And so he puts the ancestral in the futurality, in the, in the, the capacity to create a new future. 
All right. And uh, let me see. I think this might actually be, yes, my last slide. Because for me, this is really what was important. You know, again, as a person from the Global South, um, and I was educated in the Global South, I think about this, you know, even though design is very rooted in European and North American practice, what is design um, for people by the Global South, by people from the Global South, you know, and what are, I'm always asking questions about what is, what are our different epistemologies and onto, ontologies doing then? Or um, what does the design practice look like through our different epistemologies and ontologies, right? So this is Escobar's quote um, towards the end of the book, the constitution of a field of design for, by, and from the global south is thus a very welcome and timely call for two main reasons. First, because much of what goes on in the ban of design in the global north is not appropriate for design in the South and is increasingly inappropriate to a North in crisis as well. And second, because there's a great potential in design's reorientation to serve a range of theoretical and political projects in the South. And in the last section of that book, um, uh, Escobar cites fairly often, and I unfortunately didn't put in any of the quotes, um, I'm gonna say my friend who I did not know was this big author, um, Alfredo Gutierrez Borero, you know, and he's talking about, you know, there are a lot of these discussions and questions about, um, yes, design from the South and how our ontologies and epistemologies can change work um, of design in general. And so I'm gonna end it there. And we now open it up for discussion. Discussion. <laughs> Thank you for that good overview because I, I read through much of the book and I just found it very dense and I need to go back and read it again and you've just given me a very helpful framing. Thank you. Rita? Rita's hand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi. Thank you for that. That was actually really helpful because I have read the book but it was good to be reminded of. Uh, but I just wonder, this is more, uh, you know, sort of question for all of us primarily, well, I think we're all women except for one, but I think haven't a lot of the feminist writers, I mean, I can just think of Sarah Harding, who wrote a book called Is Science Multicultural in 1988. Um, and it's sort of like, why don't we acknowledge, you know, that actually probably these ideas were already in existence? Um, you know, but it's Escobar that kind of gets on the map. I mean, as much as I love his work, um, what I realize in reading his book is that I, I have to be a feminist now. You know, my work has to have a feminist um, approach to it because there's so many voices that haven't been acknowledged before. Um, so it's, it's more just a kind of general comment. <laughs> I felt like building on that, I've, I just started the book like a little bit ago, so this is helpful as well, but so I'm only the first couple chapters in. Um, but one of the first things he starts talking about is like the, the matriarchy versus the patriarchy and like how the patriarchy was the cause of all destruction. But I think like what, what I found interesting in that was actually he's taking like a non-gendered view of what those two things mean, that like matriarchy is actually just like symbolizing like a sort a sort of like leadership from a concept of like interdependence collectivity and emotion whereas patriarchy is more coming from this like competition like intervention like la 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 and for me that was an interesting reframing because it's like we can actually like get together around that you know it's not like it's not like only women can be matriarchs it's like it's actually just a set of values to live by uh, I think women are na naturally more like drawn to it and have been like heralding it, but it's interesting for me in the concept of like movement building, that if we reframe it that way, it might be easier to build movements around it. Sometimes I, I think that uh, there are some feminist movements. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a real feminist, but sometimes uh, it's not that grounded in this kind of a uh, movement that is interdependent and re relationality. So what he speaks is that um, feminist, like matri, 
materialistic way of life, it's a way of constituting society. It's not about uh, gender necessarily. So you, you can have uh, women who are not, uh, uh, who don't belong to the, the, this, uh, the, the, don't believe in this worldview. And you can have men who really believe in this materialistic uh, <coughs> worldview. So it's not only a matter of biology and, and gender. <laughs> I don't know. Isabel, what do you think? <laughs> Just... Oh my goodness. Uh, well, my thought about Harding's science multicultural is, you know, are these original ideas to herself or was she drawing on someone else? And she's talking a lot about um, the global self and possibly appropriating dialogues um, in her writing. So I, I, I would question maybe whether Harding was herself the originator of these ideas, as much as I like that book. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm having a hard day too, so my brain is a little foggy. So I might not be quite as um, <laughs> alert as normal. I have a question. My brain's a foggy too. Thank you, Renata. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and thinking about some of the ways like with transition and then looking at the global north and south and the, the difference, I start to wonder if there's any overlap between emergent strategies by Adrian Marie Brown and some of, of what Octavia Butler talks about in the parables. Um, just thinking of how people navigate and occupy spaces in different uh, ways. So I've been reading, um, I've been reading like that body of literature right now. And when I was reading the third section of Escobar's book, um, I was starting to make a connection, even though I don't know, I don't think that the connection is, re is there. So, or, or maybe it is there, but in my head, I was making the connection because he, he refers to transition imaginaries. And, and when I read Adrienne Marie Brown and Octavia Butler, and you know, that, that is a body of literature around utopia and um, utopia and social justice. And so that's the way I was making a connection, even though I placed that body of work firmly in the global north. And then I see Escobar's work as more firmly planted in the global south. So it's a different discussion about utopia and it's, a, it's social justice through a very different lens. But I guess that that connection could also be made. I, you know, I think about it because like living in New York City where you have so many different cultures and languages spoken here is that I start to feel sometime like even though we are the global north that in some ways if I go to the South Bronx in certain communities, it's really the global South that I'm experiencing. No, you're not. My, 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 my answer is just as uh, someone who lives in Canada, who lives in Toronto, in a, a city that is more than 50%, uh, uh, more than 50% are not white Canadians. I say, no, you're not experiencing the, 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 the global, global South because here we still have an expectation that uh, the the government is going to help you somehow. When you are in the global south, we, the community is very important because you know that is never going to to help you. It's not no. never going to to to, to do a, a, anything for you. So you have. I would push. I would push back on you, Renata, because I would say that I'm in scared. the South Bronx, they don't expect anything from the government. So I'm, I'm, in many ways. I, I'm seeing Laura's hand and I don't know if Laura is going to say the same thing that I want to say, but maybe connected to the keynote at Isaac, um, but maybe not. So Laura, uh, you want to jump in? Yeah, there were several keynotes, but I'd be happy to hear more. So I think of what it would, so there used to be North and South and now there's global North and global South. And I think those are different things. And I would say that yes, the Bronx is part of the global South as is inner city New Orleans. Because what it means is the, um, it builds on the work of Manuel Castells, who's a planner and sociologist in the Information Society, probably lots of other people as well. But 
the nature of the world that is underlain by um, our internet and technological globalization means that people can experience deprivations just uh, around the corner from incredible wealth and affluence. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the nature of our world is, is, is different. And so this, this Southern experience of difference and exclusion is not necessarily the same as the former South, former colonies, but is a feature of modernization and technology. And so that's one, um, I guess would say an academic way of thinking about it. And then personally also just, I would love to come to Canada. The U.S. is a different beast. Yeah, the, the different and it's different. very different here and yeah. people, it's not, run, it's not working. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, re I really think that my, my just uh, let me re reframe that I, I think that uh, the U.S. is the uh, like a colonial imperial power to exploit the, just at, at this moment. So even if you are excluded there, you, you still want, want when you want justice, you are still dealing with the you are still inside of the, the inside of the center. So I think it's a, it's a, you can call it a global south, but it's a, it's a different kind of relationship. Global south. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I see lots of hands. Uh, Vicky, I thought I saw Lisa. I thought I might have seen Isabel, but I'm going to call Vicky right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I find it interesting because it's designed for the pluriverse, but we talk, and we're talking about north and south. And I do feel that although Escobar wants to move away from these dualisms, is desperate to, he returns to them, the matriarch, the patriarch, the global south and global north, and they, they keep coming up. And I, I although I absolutely like uh, agree and follow his ambition, I do think there's still this element of being drawn back into some older debates or post-colonial debates that, that don't let him fulfill the <laughs> what the, the full message of what he's trying to say so and I think we all do that we kind of fall back into these dualisms and um and I think he's trying to say that that maybe we don't want to do that <laughs> um so that would be my my yeah my thought <laughs> okay the, I see Lisa's hand just, just the, the, oh, yeah. dual, the dualism I, how I see at least the dualism is real because uh, you have the reality of the, the, the center and all the rest disappears. All the rest is the same, the, the global south. And it's a world that is completely diverse and multiple, but inside of the, 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 the modern ontology, yes, you have the dualism. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to write about, about the, 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 the present moment without referring to, to this. That's what, what I believe. Lisa? Yeah, um, and I think, Renata, you led with, um, this is how I see it. I think perspective taking is really important in this conversation because we all have to remember, like in, in one of the slides that you had up and I was trying to look for it, you said we design our world and our world designs us back. And I think it designs our perspective. And so the one of the wonderful things about this, this opportunity to talk about a book like this is that we all have are reading it from our own perspective and our own power and privileges that we have within the culture that we live. And so I think it's something worth remembering that, um, that it doesn't have to be no, it can be and but or and other, just to remember in the conversation. Thank you. Um, Isabel, you're gonna say something? Oh, I just wanted to like from a feminist perspective, which is kind of what my specialty is in research is like the whole matriarchy versus patriarchy. It's a very kind of old school way of looking at feminism, isn't it? It's like the kind of thing that you'd read in the 80s um, that we're not, I don't think, I think people are kind of moving past in sort of a more nuanced and feminism meets queer theory perspective where there would be a big challenge to this idea of like, what is a, a woman's um, worldview? Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that. So I first heard about, um, I knew the title of Designs for the Pluriverse, but I, I heard Escobar speak before I read the book. I, maybe even I already had the book and I hadn't read it, but I heard him speak. And what drew me um, to the 
to what he was saying actually was about dualism or um, about kind of polarity where he clearly said something that I lived then as a person from this global South, you know, like when I go to design conferences, um, the work that is presented by, by a lot of the scholars from the global North is very different to the work, you know, the way that design and scholarship in the global South, I suppose happens, you know, and, and so I, I had started to already think about these differences and you know other people in the room Renata, Pedro, Penina you know maybe you all had already started to see this and then when I heard Escobar say this out loud in this conference you know where he was able to clearly outline okay well these are the issues that the designers in the global north are talking about and these are what the designers in the global south are talking about it's like oh this actually makes sense and so yes it is coming back to a dualism, but I guess the reality is that we are studying from different ontologies and different, you know, it's different questions that are that are driving us. And then the work, you know, the design work that we do is different because of these types of questions. Lorraine? Hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. I'm late. I'm late to the party here, but uh, I just wanted to say what's coming up for me in this conversation around dualism is that, you know, Marshall McLuhan's idea of figuring ground. And I think because I come from a design background and a traditional arts background, I think about that the arts implication of, you know, when you're drawing something, you're not just drawing the figure, you're also drawing the background for that thing. And one can't exist without the other. And I think that's very much kind of, having both together doesn't make one more important than the other. They have to exist at the same time and they shape each other, but not, not in a, I don't want to say oppressive, but you know, like not, not in ways that um, don't recognize each other. So I, I've, that's my hope anyway, around dualism. I, I, I think very much that they're, as humans, it's easy for us to think in twos, on or off, yes or no. <laughs> so I think it's good, like it's a, it's a good way for us to do it. But I also think like there's complexity in the ways that we relate to each other. One, one thing I to like get people's opinions on just to hear about is how all of this relates to like the natural world and how that's kind of showing up. Um, so, yeah, I would just like to get people's opinions on that. Yeah, uh, it's quite interesting that discussion on dualism. I, I was exactly scratching my head with that. How can, can you ever get away with it? And just today I was reading a very interesting article regarding um, um, traditional Chinese medicine and uh, the, the relation to anatomy of the body. So just a little bit of a um, natural world or different discipline perspective it was very very interesting that um, that the the descriptions of how the body the anatomy of the body exists was much more connected to flow and interrelations rather than how the western medicine would usually see it and I found that very kind of telling in or, uh, relation to what Escobar is kind of saying here so it doesn't say that these a different way of seeing it doesn't exist that you can describe it in dualisms but you can also describe it in in flows rather but maybe that's more difficult i don't know it's just the relation to the natural world if you look at at the same concept from different kind of perspectives like for example the traditional western anatomy and then what preceded it at what you know what came before is the the more chinese way of flow um, and looking at the relations between parts rather than the parts um, i think that gave me a little bit of a connection to you know how i might imagine um, that um, the difference between looking at the same thing but from different perspectives and getting away from dualisms maybe as well or not <laughs> i don't know i can't get it get my head around it if it's a good thing to get away from dualisms or not to be honest so <laughs> um i mean there's more to say about the connection to natural world but that was just one that popped in my head from just reading the article on traditional chinese medicine anatomy but then you can you, you see that like the relation with the natural world in your your sentence there is a, a red dualism because you can conceive that we are the natural world we are nature 
So that's the that that's another that that's another conception. It's a way of speaking. It's a way how you it's you know, and we've said that before, it's about, you know, your language, how you use what language Mm -hmm. basically says you know how it makes you express things but also how it makes you then think about things right so yeah. you know I, I definitely see that <laughs> I just don't know how you get above that yeah I'm learning that especially if if your thinking is so ingrained in language so, yeah it also changes the way you design if you consider yourself part of the natural world versus like the natural world's over here and I'm over here yeah, I was definitely. struck by this time in reading, um, reading the book at how rooted, like I hadn't picked it up before, maybe I just, I skimmed it faster, but everything is rooted actually, or tied to the natural world in, um, in Escobar's work. Like we cannot separate ourselves from nature at all. No. It's a, a, a mesh of interrelations. So instead of, oh, uh, your relation with nature, no, we are living in this mesh of, of relations with the, like a, uh, other people and with no human entities. So we, we are in that, uh, that mesh. And this kind of, uh, that's why he says, you cannot reach that understanding uh, in theory. You have to experience, you have to, be, to experience another, another ontology to, to, to be able to change your language because only in theory it's, it's very difficult. But maybe that's so hard to describe in language. I mean, lots of tacit and embodied lang feelings or experiences cannot be described. <laughs> so I think, it's, I, I was wondering in any other language, I mean, in, in German, it's, it's pretty similar, I think, to the English, you know, about dualisms and, and um, making boundaries rather than connecting things. But I really wonder in other, in other languages, do, do, you, do you think it's easier to describe this interconnectedness and this being part of it rather than separating it out into objects and they are, you know, I don't know. I know that some indigenous languages have a other structure, that they have a structure without uh, past and future. I know that in North American indigenous, uh, some, 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 uh, some things that we see as objects are seen as alive but the European language, that, that's different. That's really difficult. Laura? Yes, Laura? Um, I'm picking up on Alex's question around nature, and I, and I recognize that what our Escobar is trying to do here is call for a, um, an interdependent people, you know, humans in, in an ecological setting. And um, that is hard for most modern people to grasp the way we live and the way we're forced to make a living going to an office and getting money coming into an account and spending money in a marketplace. Um, and yeah, that's, I think that what he's asking us to do, which is, which is good. So I, I just was recognizing that um, he, he didn't train as a designer. He's a, um, he started, I, I, I've taught with his book encounter and development for many years. I te actually teach development studies. And so I used his other book. So he started as a, a nutrition planner and he went back to his native Colombia and that's where he started to realize this is all wrong we're treating these people who know these things about the earth as if they're stupid victims and need our technical assistance and so that was from the 80s and so he's been on this journey for decades to make sense of how modern world imposes these night these enlightenment ideas of science on everything and just wipes it out or or like we pretend we don't see it. I'm saying we because I'm part of this <laughs> modern landscape, right? And so he's been on this journey to learn and figure out something else. And he did this work with, with his Colum in his native Colombia, but with an indigenous, with indigenous groups about how they actually live and work in their lands and what they're trying to do. And that was his work, Territories. And then in the chat, in the chat, someone mentioned his other books and, and you know, he's written in Spanish and Portuguese. So it's like many years later, and it's interesting to watch him because he's encountered transition design and designs. I don't even know how that happened, but I think the point is that he's, he's retired and it took him a long time to go through this modern world and all the expectations to leave it behind to become a technologist to find design and then put this together and suggest that we need to do something different, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, also, just a coincidence, uh, he, he introduces the old model of environment is 
resources for people. And he mentions the sustainable development idea of the World Commission. And I'm actually just this morning making a lecture on that for my class. Where I was there in 1985 in Indonesia when we did the public hearing for with the World Commission. And so it's like um, I have this parallel world where I'm seeing, yes, it's been decades since we noticed ozone, greenhouse gases, deforestation, and we are just in worse, worse off shape, right? Um, but it isn't, I don't know. I, that, it, I just wanted to comment that the, his, it's been a long journey for him and that he's actually not a professional designer, that it's been all these different journeys he's had to struggle with, as I see it, to help make sense and, and find a path forward. So it's, it's encouraging and very disturbing. So. Yes, because like some of us may have 40 more years before we, did, before we get on that path. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know. But yes, but it's, 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 it's the life. For, I, I, I'm a designer, but I, in, my, in, my, in my life, uh, just uh, because I, li I, I lived with a native community, I worked with that in, the, in, in Brazil and then in Canada. And what I, what I see is that some places that in Brazil were very isolated, when it started this uh, awareness about the environment, about the climate change, suddenly uh, experts arrived there and completely destroyed the life of, of those com communities when they tried to, to preserve. And then they arrived the, the, the experts to teach the indigenous communities science so they could, uh, could understand the, the, the environmental policies. And it's something that I've seen uh, when I was, uh, uh, I was there when I was 10 years old and I saw all that madness that really impacted uh, my life. And now when I read the Escobar, it's like, whoa, I'm, I'm coming back home. I really remember that. I really remember all those, those things about how the, the, how the native community had to, how they could explain their way of understanding uh, uh, the, the environment, the ecosystem, it was completely impossible for them to, to, to communicate. So I, I think it's a long way to, to, to be able to create those, those bridges. Sharita. Pedro referred to something that I did not put into my summary because maybe I need, well, I needed some help to be able to do that. So I don't know, Pedro, if you want to refer to the autopoiesis, um, if you want to, and if not, we can continue the conversation going. Pedro? Yes, yes, I'm here, yes. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I was, I was writing that I don't know if I'll uh, make uh, justice to it, but I can take a stab. So he, uh, and this is on, let me, let me refer to you the, this is on like around page 160, 170 uh, maybe. So this is uh, what I think one of like, his more his most scientific rootings for the idea of uh, radical interdependence and the and design as being something else that designing for natural worlds i think at the end in his conclusion he talks about designing for life and so this autopoiesis theory what it says is that the organization of everything that uh that exists is inter connected and it's uh, built on a series of relationships and all the functions that control those relationships also exist within that network. So I think my, my interpretation of him bringing this uh, idea of uh, autopoiesis is that previously design has uh, establishes or positions them itself outside of life. Like we can design things to put in certain spaces in certain worlds if you may but it turns out that design also exists within the network of life and it's not just about living beings but also about the social organization of all these beings being human or not and i think that that uh systems approach allows him to position his uh, critique to design in a in a way that is that has some scientific approaches there's many books written by both uh, Varela and Maturana they're also they're Chilean they're also from the global south on this this particularity of uh, autopoietic systems that have relations and the functions that control those relationships live inside the system itself 
Thank you. Thank, thank you, Leslie. Uh, I have a very bad internet it's going off. It's sending me off. So I've kept the video off now. Uh, uh, thank you for doing this reading. For me, also, uh, Escobar is important because when I read uh, Encountering Development much before, and in fact, I've not finished reading the Blue Rivers ever. I've just read the introduction twice, but never managed beyond three chapters. Uh, to me, the vocabulary of dualism is somewhat easier for us to understand because we get educated in that kind of world. But there are worlds like especially because I come from India and uh, and there are communities both in the northeast of India where the tribes are still uh, very much practicing their living as they did many, many centuries back, where you have this relationality understood as multi, 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 this, it's not, this, it's not just dualisms. And I think dualisms come because it's, we are so used to comparing and it's easier for our brain to sort if, if we have to just think of one or the other. And it gets difficult for us even in, in sciences to imagine worlds beyond some dimensions, like beyond the third dimension, it gets complicated for even science to it, or even traditional science or the Newtonian sciences, or even the uh, uh, to explain things. So, uh, and there are like even like when Rita talks about uh, about uh, Bali, when uh, Rita is talking about Bali, there is this person who writes extensively on the water temples, Stephen Lansing, who was again talking about how and what development did to the ecology of relationality that was there in the community and with the living and without the living. So between the water, the plants, uh, the fields, the insects, the humans, and the hierarchies of the humans between the priests and the farm. So it's because I think we've all looked and got educated in design from a very, uh, it, it is after all the tool of modernism and capitalism that we find it difficult to look at the pluriverse at times. Thank you. I said possibly epistemology, oh, sorry, not epistemologies of the South, pluriversal politics is the next one, right? Uh, you're on mute, Renata. Pluriversal politics. It's, okay. uh, like uh, also Escobar. So we, we go deeper into his, his ideas before we we switch to to uh, another switch to to epistemologies of the South. Okay. So this has been great, um, and uh, we look forward to meeting you again.